And I commend it to you. Thank you, Senator Scar. It being right on 2 p.m., I'll call Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday, the minister said, and I quote, we are in a relatively good position. What percentage of all COVID-19 deaths in Australia relate to people in residential aged care? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the proportion of, um, de of deaths in, uh, in aged care as a proportion of the, the total deaths sits at about 70 per cent in Australia. At about 70 per cent. That's not the exact number, uh, but it's about 70 per cent. Uh, and, Mr President, um, if, you can, you, if you compare that, um, it's, and that's about 0.17 per cent of the aged care beds uh, in Australia. Uh, and the reason that I made the, the relativity comment, and I, and I answered in the question yesterday, was that in the UK that number is um, the relativity of, of the number of deaths in residential aged care compared to the population is 5.3%, which is over 30 times as bad as Australia. It's worse, it's worse than, than Australia by a, a factor of, almost, of over 30 times. Mr. President, I don't say that to downplay any of the deaths that have occurred Order. in Australia in residential aged care. And in fact, uh, Mr. President, the interjections are quite offensive. Uh, I'm not trying to, uh, to do anything but to, to, but to state some actual facts with respect to this. Uh, and the Labor Party might like to play politics with this. They might like to talk Australia's effort down. That's fine. That's fine, Order. Mr. President. Order. But can I say the public health response in Australia? Senator Watt, the public health response Senator Watt, in Australia. Senator Cormann, on a point of order. Senator Watt, remember my rule about counting to ten after your name has been called. Senator Cormann. Uh, interjections are always disorderly, and I believe they're even more disorderly in the current uh, environment where we are seeking to maintain a COVID-safe workplace. Order, order. I, I, when there's silence, I'll call Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Well, we, 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 we are on the point of order. I would respond to the Leader of the Government and the Senate by saying uh, this is about the Minister's accountability and his accountability for his incompetence in the portfolio, order. which has caused Senator Wong, deaths. Senator Wong, that's not an appropriate way to address a point of order. Um, I don't believe it's unparliamentary. It was completely out of order to use a point of order for that. Um, it is not up to me to rule which interjections are disorderly or not. They are always disorderly. Um, interjections are not a method of holding a minister accountable. Questions and answers are. I ask senators to respect that um, and hear the minister in silence. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr President. And, and, uh, Senator Walsh asks about the, the comparability. In Australia, we have had outbreaks in 200 residential aged care facilities, unfortunately. Very unfortunately, that's 7.7 per cent of the 2,706 residential aged care facilities in Australia. In the, new, in the UK, of the 9,081 care homes, uh, 56 per cent have had an outbreak. Mr. President. Um, Order, six... Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Order, Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. Does the minister accept the evidence to the Aged Care Royal Commission that the percentage of deaths in Australia that relate to people in residential aged care, and I quote, makes Australia the country with one of the highest rates in the world of residential aged care deaths as a proportion of deaths from COVID-19? Yes or no? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, what I don't do, Mr. President, is accepted as a reasonable measure. It is a, it is a fact, uh, as it was. Order. It, it, it was actually evident, and I'll take the interjection, Mr. President. It was actually evidence given to the Royal Commission. It wasn't the Royal Commission. Saying Order, that. Senator Watt. And, and so, Mr. President, uh, as as I said, as a proportion of uh, the the fatalities, as a proportion of the Senator aged care Pratt. beds in Australia, amounts to about 0.1 per cent, 0.17 per cent. 
of the aged care bids in this country. In the UK, it's 5.3, which is over 30 times worse than Australia. And while every single death is a tragedy in this pandemic, and in, and in, and in seven out of eight states, we don't have a case in residential aged care. And unfortunately, in Victoria, where we Order. have uncontrolled community spread, uh, it, the virus has inevitably got into residential aged care. That is what happens. Order, Senator it Colbeck. Has, time for the answer has Despite expired. Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. It is one of your colleagues waiting. Senator Walsh, your final supplementary question. A woman who sadly lost her father from COVID-19 at St Basil's described the moment she learnt her father had died as the worst call of my life. Yesterday, the minister said we had been, and I quote again, in a very good position. Does the minister expect this woman and her grieving family to agree? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. Mr President, and thanks, Senator Walsh, for the question. Actually, no, I don't, because this family has been tragically impacted by the deadly nature of COVID-19. Uh, and, and, I, and I give her and her family my heartfelt condolences. I've spoken to many of these families myself, Mr President. Uh, I've spent time talking to them on community meetings, but I've also spoken to a number of them individually when they've wanted to have a conversation about what's occurred. Uh, we've, uh, We've set up an investigation into what happened at St Basil's, I think appropriately, so that we can understand the epidemiology of that event. We can understand what happened with respect to the delays in us in the Commonwealth being notified of the event, what impact that delay in notification had. And so, Mr President, I understand perfectly that this family would be completely and utterly devastated by the loss of their life. Order, life Senator Colbeck. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Border travel restrictions imposed by state and territory governments have negatively impacted the lives and livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of regional Australians who live and work in and across border communities. Can the Minister please outline what steps the National Cabinet is taking to secure a national approach from state and territory governments to issues of quarantine, essential movement across borders and the identification of hotspots to ensure that regional and rural Australians' access to health care, education and employment is not limited unnecessarily. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator McKenzie for that question. Mr President, the government is committed to keeping Australia as open as possible in a way that is COVID safe. Uh, in the wake of this pandemic, we must always be focused on protecting both people's lives and people's livelihoods. We are working with state and territory governments to put in place practical, common sense solutions to a whole series of problems that have arisen as a result of hard state border closures, which are affecting access to services and our economic recovery. For example, we need to ensure that relevant exemptions are in place and applied consistently and efficiently so that disruptions to critical services for border residents are minimised as much as possible. National Cabinet has previously codified the freight protocol, ensuring freight can keep moving efficiently and safely during this pandemic. Last Friday, National Cabinet noted some recent changes by states and territories to make it easier for people to cross borders subject to appropriate arrangements to access essential services and activities. Since Monday, farmers and critical agricultural workers who reside outside the border zone in Victoria now have a new pathway to enter New South Wales and move outside the border bubble for work. For people living in the border zone, a permit can be obtained for travel within the border zone for the purpose of work if they cannot work from home and to obtain medical care or access to health supplies. Victorian residents can obtain a permit to enter New South Wales for the purpose of receiving non-emergency medical or hospital services with no permit required in emergency situations. On Friday, National Cabinet also asked the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee to develop a common understanding of a hotspot uh, of a hotspot across jurisdictions and consider movement restrictions for affected residents in that context. 
This further work will provide people who are living in those areas, particularly in rural and regional border communities, with clear guidance on where and when they can access health and other services or where restrictions order, might Senator mean they Coleman, have to find alternative the time for the arrangements. Has expired. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you. The Victorian Labor government has imposed strict restrictions on regions not impacted by COVID-19 and just announced that these may continue for a further 12 months whilst failing to stop Melburnians heading out to the regions. Can the minister please advise what impact preemptive border restrictions may have on health edu and education access, employment and people in need of compassionate consideration? Senator Cormann. No, thank you very much, Mr. President. We have seen widely reported examples of hardship for residents in rural and regional border, border communities. Such impacts should, of course, be minimised wherever possible, and they can be minimised in a way that is COVID safe. Throughout this pandemic, when it comes to restrictions on people's freedoms, we have been guided by the medical advice. Decisions on border restrictions must continue to be informed by public health advice. Ultimately, these are matters for the states and territories. However, it is up to the states Order. and territories to set out clearly the medical advice informing their decisions and to ensure that there is a genuine public health upside in return for the restrictions and costs imposed on individual Australians and on our communities, in particular rural and regional communities across Australia. There is no rule book on how best to deal with this crisis, but it is critical that decisions are made on the basis of advice from the medical experts and not based on political considerations. Indeed, that is why the National Cabinet has asked the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee to develop a consistent Order, approach Senator to Coleman. hotspot management Time and the, the needs of border has residents. Expired. Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Border restrictions are severely impacting our agricultural industry and food supply chains due to creating significant workforce limitations. Can the minister please provide an update to the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is taking steps to address these concerns? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank uh, the Leader of the Nationals for that question. National Cabinet agreed on 21 August to the development of an agricultural workers' code which would set out nationally consistent measures to support the movement of workers critical to the agricultural sector across state borders. The code would help to support individuals and occupations that help ensure the continuity of the agricultural sector. Without these workers, agriculture in Australia comes to a halt, with all of the consequences of that, including for people in the city. Very important for all of us to remember. This includes not just on-farm workers, such as shearers, grain harvesters and fruit pickers, but also those who provide agricultural businesses with critical services such as vets and agricultural mechanics. Sheep still need shearing, crops still need harvesting, and animals still need to be attended to by vets. Uh, there have been recent encouraging changes to exemptions in Queensland, New South Wales and South Australia, but there is more work to be done with Order. the New South Senator Wales Coleman. Victorian border in particular. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Citizen, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday, the minister said, and I quote, we have been extremely fortunate. Does the minister really believe the 100 families who have lost loved ones in the last seven days to accept that we have been extremely fortunate? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians. Thank Senator you, Mr. Colbert. President. Uh, I don't think that the families who have lost loved ones would be feeling anything other than grief, Mr. President, and I understand that. Uh, they've, they've suffered tragic losses, uh, uh, all 342 of them now. They've all suffered a really tragic loss, and again, my condolences and the government's condolences to them. But, Mr President, um, in a comparative sense, the Australian government's management of the COVID-19 outbreak has been relatively good. In fact, I would rather be here in Australia than I would be anywhere in the world right now. I would rather be in Australia than anywhere else in the world. And that is also reflected, that is also reflected Order. in the figures that we have Order. with respect to the numbers of, of, uh, of contractions of the virus in our residential aged care system. Uh, while the Labor Party might like to hang on uh, calculations that place Australia in a bad light. Australia, on my left. In, in a, in a, if you're looking at the aged care stats on an international basis, uh, we are doing relatively well. 
and, and the government takes no the, the, the government takes no pleasure in the fact that these families have suffered this tragic loss because it is a tragic loss and I don't expect any of those families mr. president to, f to feel anything but the loss that they've felt it is but it, but in if you look at our situation in a global sense mr. president the Australian circumstance in a global sense and our management of COVID-19 compared to the rest of the world I'd rather be here in Australia than I would be almost any other country in the world Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. The minister just said he would rather be in Australia than any other country in the world and that the government has done reasonably well. The day before uh, this man uh, died in St Basil's, a resident received a call telling them their father was comfortably sitting in his room, isolated from a major coronavirus outbreak gripping the facility, when in reality their father was gravely unwell at the Northern Hospital. Minister, why should this man and his grieving family except that the government has done reasonably well. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Keneally, for the question. Um, it is disappointing that the opposition seeks to reinterpret what I'm saying in one context and apply it to another context. I've done, I, have, I have done nothing, Mr. President. Order. I have done nothing Order. but express Order. my sympathies. And the Senators on my left, order. Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. Order on my left. If I can't hear the minister, I won't be able to deal with inevitable points of order. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it, it is disappointing that the opposition t tries to take my comments out of context and apply them in a different circumstance, because that's not what I've said on any, on any occasion. I have done nothing but express my sympathies for every family every family who's suffered a loss because they are all suffering a family tragedy and so i take offence at the fact that senator keneally tries to use my words in a way that i have never uttered them it is it is in fact quite outrageous order that she senator colbeck time for the answer has expired order order senator Faruqi, on a I, I, you're next I think. I've got Senator Keneally for a final supplementary question. A diabetic 75-year-old woman with COVID-19 was forced to go without breakfast, was left for hours in a urine-soaked bed due to a lack of staff. Does the, go does the minister really believe that the government has done reasonably well in addressing this aged care crisis and the COVID-19 outbreak in age residential aged care homes? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, Senator Keneally deliberately misquotes and verbals me with respect to the words I've, I've used uh, and the context within which I've used them. And Mr. President, I and the government have acknowledged that in some circumstances, but particularly at St. Basil's, where we had 24 hours to restaff the entire facility, including management, that things didn't go as we thought they should have done. We, that things didn't go Order. as we thought they should have done, and we've acknowledged it and we've apologised for it, Mr. President. So, and, and Mr. President, so um, the, the families of these residents um, have Order, suffered. Senator the Pratt. families have suffered a, an absolute tragedy, Mr. President. Uh, but I will not take Senator Keneally misusing what I've said and placing it completely out of context because it's completely unreasonable. Order, for Senator Colbeck. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education. Minister, at least 16 members of the government, including the Prime Minister, went to uni while it was free. But your latest cruel, hypocritical plan will hurt students by hiking fees and cuts up to $900 million from teaching funding including from STEM and nursing. The experts agree it's an unfixable mess. It won't create enough new places. It punishes struggling students. Your own department admitted it won't change student choices, and it in incentivizes unis to enroll students in high-fee courses instead of STEM. The whole thing relies on useless job market predictions and bad data to punish students without saving uni jobs or fixing the research crisis. 
Youth wage growth is the flattest in history, and unemployment is skyrocketing. How can you justify condemning students to decades of debt? Minister representing the Minister for Education, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. I thank Senator Faruqi for her question, uh, much of which uh, I disagree with uh, the information uh, that she, uh, she presents as, uh, as fact in that question. But I do think there are a couple of granules within, uh, within all of that, that there are too many uh, graduates coming out of universities at, uh, at present uh, who are not necessarily securing a job, a well-paying job, a job particularly in the field of their studies. And our reforms that, uh, that we are presenting in relation to higher education seek to address some of those problems, to ensure that the way in which, uh, the way in which uh, students uh, are encouraged into university and supported through university does result in the optimal chances of them securing a job uh, and indeed a job in the field of their training, study and ideally desires. Contrary to what Senator Faruqi says, there are no cuts in terms of Commonwealth funding or support. Indeed, funding for the Commonwealth Grants Scheme uh, will continue to increase uh, by CPI, uh, and overall university funding will increase from $18 billion in 2020 to $19 billion by 2022. Uh, that will be some 10 per cent uh, growth relative to the 2018 uh, position. Uh, Ms Tian published the draft legislation of our Job Ready Graduates Package for consultation uh, and indeed uh, has now worked through that consultation phase uh, and has presented a plan that will create more places for more students to attend university, an additional 39,000 places by 2023, an additional 100,000 places by 2030. No existing student is going to see changes in relation uh, to their fees, but universities will see their record funding continuing to grow whilst we create the right incentives to encourage students uh, to study in areas that optimise the chances of them securing a job Order. and meeting our economic Senator needs of the future. Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, you are actually forcing universities to enrol students, more students, thousands more, while cutting funding, and that is true for their education by an average of 15 per cent. This means fewer teachers and bigger classes, a poorer quality of education across the board, and particularly in regional unis where the cost of delivery is higher. Minister, will you acknowledge that your plan is going to hurt the quality of uni education? And if you were still education minister, would you have brought forward this cruel plan? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr. President, I do congratulate Minister Tian on, uh, on the reforms that he's proposing. You know, reforms that will see, for example, students who choose to study teaching, nursing, clinical psychology, English or languages paying some 40 per cent less for their degrees in terms of the contribution that they make. I would have thought Senator Faruqi might welcome that. I would have thought there might be some acknowledgement uh, of that. Uh, students who study architecture or maths will pay around 60 per cent less in terms of the student contribution for their degree. Students who study science, health, architecture, environmental science, environmental science, Senator Faruqi, uh, IT or engineering will pay around 20 per cent less in terms of contribution for their degree. This is about making sure that we equip Australia and young Australians for the future with skills that will help them to get a job and our economy to grow and recover in the post-COVID era. Senator Faruqi, a final supplementary question. Minister, your government has stood by while thousands of university workers have lost their jobs. The likes of Crown Casino have received more than $100 million in JobKeeper, but you have changed the rules three times to maliciously lock universities out. Now you're intent on cutting funding, hiking fees and punishing struggling students. Minister, what do you have against universities? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, this is a quintessential problem that exists with the Australian Greens. You can say whatever you want in terms of outlining the facts, and they are just completely ignored. I outline the growth in funding. I outline the Green might be a shared problem with the Labor Party. That's why they're all on that side of the chamber, Senator Cormann. You outline the fact that funding continues to grow right into the future, and Senator Faruqi still stands up and talks about cuts in funding to Australian universities. She tries to draw an analogy to private sector businesses who have seen their revenue collapse in terms of 
their business operations, whereas what the Australian government has done for universities is provide guaranteed ongoing funding to those universities during this COVID-19 crisis. So there's guaranteed funding that the Australian government continues to provide on behalf of taxpayers and students to universities. There's growing funding in Order, the future, Senator and there are better incentives for, answer for has students. Expired. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on the Morrison government's COVID-19 vaccine strategy? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. Uh, Mr. President, we know that uh, the search for the vaccine is one upon which the world is focused. Without a vaccine, as we know, we won't be able to return fully to the life uh, that we have known prior to COVID-19. And you only have to look at the changes that we've had to make here in the Parliament as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Australian government is taking targeted action to ensure that Australians have access to safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines if and when they become available. Mr President, our strategy is fourfold. The first is research. We've allocated over $358 million towards research in relation to vaccines, preventions, treatment and respiratory medicines. Most significantly, there's been an investment of $5 million in the University of Queensland molecular clamp. Another vaccine funding round is opened and the government expects to receive the peer-reviewed recommendations shortly. The second is direct procurement with leading international vaccine candidates. We have already announced our agreement with AstraZeneca and negotiations are advanced with multiple other candidates. The third is participation in the International COVAX facility, which is an international consortium to give participants participant nations access to a variety of potential vaccine candidates. It acts as a common platform for investment in return for common participation in whichever vaccine is successful. And the fourth is onshore manufacturing capacity for a vaccine in Australia, either directly or under a licence, including through CSL. Mr President, we're confident that these investments and actions will secure early and sufficient access to a safe and effective vaccine. Senator Bragg, a Thank supplementary you. question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate how the government's agreement with AstraZeneca will ensure Australia gets access to this important vaccine if it is successful? Order on my left. Order, order. I'm going. Order on my left. I'll call the senator to continue when there's quiet. Senator Bragg. I'm going to read it again. I've got most of it, sure. Senator Bragg. Can keep, the keep, minister? Keep, keep. <laughs> We're wasting time. The opposition tends to find valuable. Senator Watt. Can the Senator minister Bragg. advise the Senate how the government's agreement with AstraZeneca will ensure Australia gets access to this important vaccine if it is successful? Order, Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. As the Prime Minister and the Health Minister have stated last week. The government signed a letter of intent with the UK-based drug company AstraZeneca that would mean Australians get access to the University of Oxford COVID-19 vaccine for free should trials prove successful, safe and effective. The government and AstraZeneca Order. are committed to working together so that all Australians will get access to such a vaccine. Of the 160 different vaccine projects in the world, the Oxford vaccine is one of the most advanced and promising. Crucially, the letter of intent between the government and AstraZeneca covers all of the steps that are needed to bring a new vaccine to market. It covers vaccine development, production and distribution. Senator Watt. Mr President, the government will continue discussions with many, many of these developers while at the same time backing Australian researchers. We will continue to take advice from our best medical, scientific and manufacturing experts. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, Order. as we await the development of a vaccine, why is it important to maintain social distancing and practical health steps to minimise the risk of transmitting the virus so we can reopen and grow a COVID safe economy? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as the entire world watches and waits for a vaccine, uh, it has never been more important to observe appropriate health 
precautions. And indeed, the second wave that the state of Victoria on my uh, is now experiencing has made it abundantly clear in terms of how vigilant we need to be in observing practices like social distancing. In June and July of this year, we saw positive signs of economic recovery in the states that have suppressed the virus. As we minimise the transmission and the risk of transmission, we minimise the risk of harming the economy. Mr. President, we must all exercise an abundance of caution and continue to follow the medical advice on the practical steps that will keep us all safe. And again, stay 1.5 metres away from other people whenever and wherever we can. Maintain good hand washing and coughing and sneezing hygiene. Stay at home if you're unwell and get tested if we have respiratory symptoms or a fever. And of course, download the COVID Safe app so that we Order. can find Senator the virus Cash. more quickly. Time for the answers expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. When did the minister first learn he had been cut out of decision making in the aged care emergency response? Was the minister ever consulted on the decision to exclude him? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the reality is that there's been no change in the decision-making process with respect to the establishment of a, an aged care Order. response centre in any state. Uh, Mr President, uh, I think the interjection from behind me is correct. Don't always believe what you read in the newspaper, Mr President. Uh, the, the decisions around the establishment Order. of an aged care response centre uh, are, be, are made through the AHPPC. Uh, that is the decision-making process. Under the auspices of the National Cabinet, it's been discussed at National Cabinet now on two occasions, uh, last Friday and a fortnight before. Uh, and, uh, Mr. President, the HPPC has uh, and does report to the Health Minister. So, in that context, as uh, uh, an organisation that reports to the Health Minister in implementing our national COVID-19 health response, uh, that's the decision-making line. So nothing has changed, Mr. President. It's always as it was. Uh, but I and uh, my department uh, play an important operational role in the oversight of all of those facilities, uh, as I do in Victoria. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Has the minister been sidelined because he failed to produce a COVID-19 plan specifically for the aged care sector, or because he failed to learn the tragic lessons of Newmarch House? or because he forgot the number of deaths in residential aged care on Friday, or because he couldn't get the number of deaths right again yesterday? Or was it because of the first, second or the 328th tragic and avoidable death of an older Australian in aged care? Senator Colbeck. Mr. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, I just reject the com completely reject the premise of the question. I completely reject the Senator, premise of the question, Senator, Mr President. Uh, don't believe everything that you read in the paper. Don't believe everything that you read in the newspaper. I've just, I've just explained the process for the establishment of these centres. Mr President, I was consulted in the process for the formation of these centres across Australia before the documentation went to National Cabinet last week. So I was well aware of all of the processes last week before any decisions were made with respect to the formation of of a recovery centre in any other state, uh, because I played a part, firstly, in the formation of the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, and also in the process for the decision making of those that might be required subsequently. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. If the minister is being cut out of decision making in his own portfolio, can he tell Australian taxpayers exactly what he is being paid for? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Watt demonstrates what happens when you just read the pre-written supplementary that you've been given before question time, rather than listening to the answer that's just been given. Mr. President, I've just explained the process uh, that's uh, been involved with the design of recovery and response centres for aged care in all of the states. I've in explained my involvement in it, and I've explained the process by which they're approved. And I stand by my answer. Senator Rennick. Order. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. 
How is the Morrison government growing a COVID-safe economy by supporting Australian exporters and helping to keep Australians who rely on the exporting sector in jobs through the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Rennick for his question. Uh, a known champion of Australian business and, uh, and Australian jobs, and particularly those from Queensland. Mr. President, right across the globe, far too many businesses, far too many jobs have been tragically disrupted by COVID-19. Some of those disruptions, including here in Australia, have been unavoidable as a result of necessary shutdowns and restrictions across economies. Now, others have been consequential disruptions, and indeed. For many of our exporting businesses, uh, they have been a victim of the consequences uh, of different restrictions, particularly for those exporting premium produce to the world. They have been victims of the shutdown of international aviation. An estimated 80 even 90 per cent of international air freight out of Australia is traditionally carried in the bellies of passenger aircraft, which of course are no longer flying. That is why our government has injected more than $350 million into the International Freight Assistance Mechanism. It's targeted, it's temporary, and it's providing emergency support to make sure that exporters, while still having to pay a premium to get their goods to market, can at least still get it to market. Indeed, we have sent and supported Western Australian pork getting to Singapore, Tasmanian salmon to Taiwan, Cairns coral trout to Hong Kong, New South Wales tuna to Japan, South Australian kingfish to Europe, and Victorian lamb to the UAE. IFAM is providing also important support for medical imports coming back into the country, critical, essential imports in our national interest. To date, uh, IFAM has supported an estimated 4,376 flights that would otherwise probably not have occurred, from nine domestic departure points to over 65 international destinations, carrying 94,500 tonnes representing more than $1.1 billion in export value to our nation, ensuring those Order, exports still flow Time for the and the income and jobs has for expired. Australia. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Uh, can the minister advise what feedback he has received from Australian business and Australian exporters about the International Freight Assistance Mechanism package? Senator Birmingham. While farmers and our exporters work incredibly hard to secure export contracts around the globe, and the last thing we want to see is them lose that reputation for reliability and lose those contracts simply because they can't get their goods to market. And so businesses across the country, exporters across the country, have welcomed uh, the work of IFAM, indeed in Senator Rennick's home state of Queensland. Uh, the Australian Reef Fish Trading Company in Cairns has said that without IFAM we would be in survival mode. But instead, in the last two months, they have put on two new people and increased their administration officer from part-time to full-time. The availability and reliability of flights has allowed them to commit to buying fish from the boats. That has kept them in business and their crews in jobs, with flow-on impact to fuel supplies, mechanical workshops, bait and wholesalers. Indeed, Sunpork in Kingaroy says the IFAM initiative was an extremely useful stimulus when passenger transport came to an abrupt halt and our normal freight avenues were cut off. While Prime Fish from the Gold Coast acknowledges that because of IFAM Order. we've been able to get Senator produce Birmingham. to where Time it needs the to go. Expired. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. In comparison to other countries, can the minister update the Senate on how the Australian goods export sector is faring during, during the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, like all aspects of the economy, there are impacts because of the disruptions, not just to air freight, but disruptions in a whole range of other ways. And in the first six months of this year, uh, Australia, Australian goods exports have been down 3.7 per cent on the same period in 2019. But they're still worth in excess of $183 billion. And if we compare that 3.7 per cent decline for Australia with elsewhere around the world, we can see that preliminary OECD data shows an average goods export decline across OECD nations in excess of 15 per cent. It's 3.7 per cent decline for Australia, but more than 15 per cent for the OECD on average. Across the G7, it's estimated to have been a decline in excess of 17 per cent. In the US, a decline in excess of 16 per cent. In Canada, in excess of 18 per cent. In Japan, in excess of 14 per cent. That demonstrates that Australia's exporters continue to navigate the complexities of this time, Order, generating exporting income and jobs for Australia. The answer Australians. has expired. Senator Lambie. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Minister Reynolds. On 5 February 2020, the Prime Minister announced that the Australian Government would establish a new National Commissioner for Defence and Veterans Suicide Prevention to inquire into suicides of serving and former ADF members. Part of this announcement was the appointment of an interim commissioner to commence a review of known and current former defence personnel suicides dating back to 2001. My question to the minister is, who is the interim commissioner? The minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Lambie for her, her question. Uh, I can confirm for Senator Lambie in the Senate that legislation will shortly be introduced by the Attorney General to set up the uh, office of, uh, of the um, commissioner, of the permanent commissioner. As I said, the interim commissioner will be appointed uh, shortly uh, to implement, uh, implement that work. So, Senator Lambie, if, oh, oh, would you like me to finish? Sure. Thank you. So what I can confirm is, once appointed by the Attorney General, the National Commissioner will work to identify and undertake the factors and the systemic issues that may contribute uh, to suicide risk amongst serving and former members. Uh, they will have all of the powers of a Royal Commissioner. The government has been acting on this, and as I said, the Attorney General will be introducing legislation shortly to set up this position. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. As part of the February 5 announcement, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Veterans Affairs and yourself all said that an interim commissioner would immediately, immediately commence a review of historical suicides and report within 12 months. Did that review commence immediately as promised? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, look, as I've said, we've got the legislation underway for the permanent commissioner and to set that up this week. As part of that process, we will still be appointing an interim commissioner, and the Attorney General is in the process at the moment of uh, going through a short list for the interim commissioner to undertake the work as discussed. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. If you say something is ready to go immediately, your words, not mine, how can it possibly be delayed? It's either ready to go or it isn't. Was it ready to go in February? And if not, why did you claim it was? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. As I announced in February, we did say that we, we would bring forward uh, this office of the Commissioner uh, that would have the powers of the Royal Commission and we would establish an interim commissioner, which, as I've said, the Attorney General currently has a short list of applicants uh, for, that process, for that interim process. Uh, but I would also note that we did say that we would appoint a family veterans advocate, and in fact we have done so with an outstanding uh, person who has been appointed by the Governor General, Ms Gwen Churn, as a veterans family advocate. So we have actually uh, implemented that, and we will shortly be announcing the interim, the interim commissioner. So we are delivering on exactly what we promised to deliver. We've got the legislation in train, uh, we've got in train the appointment of the interim commissioner, and we have appointed an outstanding family veteran advocate. So this government is delivering exactly Order. what we said we would do, Senator Lambie. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Minister, when asked on Friday whether you'd brief the Cabinet between the 10th of July and the 5th of August, the Minister said, and I quote, I don't believe that I attended a Cabinet meeting in that period. I'll check the record for you. Given the Minister has had four days to check the record, did he brief the Cabinet on the growing crisis in aged care in that period? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Gallagher for the question. Uh, I didn't brief the cabinet in that period of time, but, but Mr. President, um, I have been participating on a daily call with the Prime Minister, uh, senior colleagues, the Health Minister, uh, and, and so effectively a subcommittee of the cabinet every day, every day, all through uh, uh, this, the, particularly the Victorian circumstance, uh, and sometimes twice a day. So, Mr. President, this is not uh, what, as the Labor Party might try and play it, uh, some sort of frivolous process. We have been working very closely on a daily basis to address the circumstance, particularly in Victoria. Um, and so, I've been working with the PM 
with the Finance Minister, uh, Senator Rustin, the Treasurer, the Health Minister, uh, and, and a number of other colleagues and senior departmental officials across agencies every day to bring the resources to bear that we require to manage what was a, a growing outbreak in Victoria. Uh, and we needed to inje in, inject significant resources to assist both the Victorian government and the aged care sector in Victoria to deal with what was a growing situation. Uh, and we continue to do that. We continue to meet on a regular basis. And I have a, a separate meeting every day with the Victorian Aged Care Recovery Centre to get a situation update on the circumstance that's going on in, the, in, the, in Victoria, in particular, given the continuing situation that is there. So the government uh, is not, as is attempted to be portrayed by the opposition, doing anything other than putting its full attention full attention to this at the at at the highest levels on order, a daily Senator Colbeck, sometimes time twice for the daily answer basis. has expired senator gallagher a supplementary question uh, thank you uh, mr president as minister for aged care in this government when did you first brief the cabinet about the outbreak in residential aged care in victoria senator colbeck mr president i have spoken to the Prime Minister and senior cabinet colleagues on a daily basis with risk to order Senator Gallagher on a point of order order uh, direct relevance it was a direct question about when he briefed first briefed the cabinet not when he had a chat with the Prime Minister that's not the question we asked Senator Cormann very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Corbeck is directly relevant to the question asked. Uh, he's explaining uh, that he uh, has had daily conversations with the leader of the cabinet, the leader of the cabinet, and indeed with all of the ministers that are part of the key uh, cabinet subcommittee, the expenditure review committee, and uh, and others, as appropriate. And that is in, the, in a moment of crisis. That is, of course, what Australians would expect their Minister for Aged Care to do, and the Minister is being directly order. relevant to the Se question. Senator Wong, I'll take Senator Wong on the point of order, and then I'll rule. Thank you, Mr President. The, uh, question, the, the point of order is direct relevance. The Minister has uh, been asked and answered a question about the Cabinet briefing. He is now seeking to avoid answering another question about Cabinet briefing in relation to an unprecedented crisis in aged care which has caused the deaths of many Australians. We would ask the minister to be directly relevant to the question, which is when did he first brief the cabinet about this unprecedented crisis? First, I will say the minister has been speaking for eight seconds, so it is difficult to make a strict judgment on direct relevance at that point in a one-minute answer. Secondly, um, I'm not willing to rule that a minister who is strictly talking about his conversations or discussions with the Prime Minister is not directly relevant to a question regarding whether he briefed a cabinet, given that the cap Prime Minister is the head of cabinet. However, the, ma answer must be na the answer must be narrow in its scope to that. It is not up to me to instruct a minister how to. It is. It, it, it's not up to me how to. In to instruct the minister how to answer a question, it is up to others to judge or debate after question time. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. And as, as I have said, I am not going to allow the Labor Party to try and attempt any suggestion that this government has not been putting its full focus on the management of this entire COVID-19 outbreak. And I have been present at the subcommittee of cabinet meetings since March to discuss on each of the occasions that it has convened, and since July it would be daily or sometimes twice daily to manage the circumstance in Victoria. The outbreak in Victoria has had the full attention of me, my fellow ministers that are involved in that subcommittee of cabinet and the Prime Minister on a daily Order. basis. Senator Colbeck, Since the time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final So I presume the question. answer to that question was you never, ever have. Um, Minister, in light of the unprecedented crisis in residential aged care in Victoria, with the loss, sadly, of more than 328 lives, how can you possibly justify not briefing the federal cabinet 
about this unprecedented crisis in aged care. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, the Labor Party tries to make this something that, that it's not. And as I've said, I am focusing, focusing on my job with the ARC, ERC, with the Prime Minister on a daily basis, with the Finance Minister, with the Treasurer, with the Minister for Social Security uh, and anyone else who is seconded to the committee with the Minister for Health on a daily basis. Any suggestion that the Labor Party tries to make that this pandemic has not received my full attention, the Prime Minister's full attention and the government's full attention is just not so, Mr President. We have been there every single day to make sure that the resources that need to be brought to bear can be brought to bear and are brought to bear. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. How is the Morrison government ensuring people with disability and their carers have access to appropriate and accessible information during the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank uh, Senator Chandler for this really important question. You know, clearly, the coronavirus is going to impact disproportionately on certain groups in our community. Um, these groups are more likely to be at risk uh, of contracting the virus and more likely to have poorer health outcomes, and none so more so than many of our people who live with disability. So, Making sure that people with disability, their families and their carers uh, can access information about such things as preventative measures, good hygiene and where to get the appropriate supports that they might need to get them through the pandemic have never been more important. Uh, and that's why the government has provided additional funding for a disability information hotline specifically directed in providing advice around the COVID-19 pandemic. This free 1800 uh, number is available 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. Monday to Friday, and it provides information, it provides referrals, it provides support and emotional support and counselling uh, to people who are impacted uh, by either living with disability or supporting somebody who does live with disability. We've made sure that our staff are highly trained so that they can understand what the person needs and making sure that they can provide them with the information and the support that they may need and making sure that they're directing them to things uh, such as knowing where to get PPE, knowing if they need food relief, where to get that, and just making sure that there's a friendly voice on the end of the phone if these people want someone to talk to. Since April, we're delighted to say that a number of people living with disability, their carers and supporters, have used the services of the hotline. Um, over 2,700 calls have been received. Um, many of them are telephone-based, but also online. And more than 1,700 uh, of these calls have been able to be referred to appropriate services to support these people in the particular areas that they need. And we wanted to make sure that through this process, that people who live with disability were able to get the flexibility and choice around the services Order, they needed. Senator Rustin. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the minister for her response. What is the government doing, Minister, to support the mental health and well-being of people, including people with disability and their carers, in response to COVID-19? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, the government absolutely recognises the significant effect that, that this COVID pandemic is having on the mental health of all Australians. And people who live with disability um, are also um, significantly impacted by this, whether it be through isolation, um, meaning that, uh, that they are they're cut away from or kept away from people that might be supporting them or their loved ones, um, whether it be social distancing um, or a number of other restrictions that are placed on Australians. That's why we have provided additional support to all Australians, but particularly in recent times, an additional $12 million has been made available to make sure that people in Victoria have access 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, to health services. This might be things like Lifeline, it might be Headspace, it might be Kids Helpline, because we want to make sure that the services, for, so that people can seek support and get the counselling they need. This is part of a $500 million mental health package that's been put in place by this government to support mental health during this pandemic. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, into the future, how will the government ensure best practice support for people with disability who have experienced complex trauma? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, clearly positive, 
positive experiences with support workers and carers and, and advocates for people with disability is absolutely critical in reducing or minimising uh, harm and trauma, and it helps to foster a trauma-informed recovery and healing process. Um, we, as the government, are funding a development of a best practice guide to make sure support for people with disability is appropriately targeted to their experiences to make sure that it is trauma-informed. The government is fund providing funding to Blue Knot, a well-known supporter um, of counselling services, um, to develop this guide. Blue Knot actually has already developed guides, uh, similar types of guides. Uh, in fact, they published the Practical Guide for Clinical Treatment of Complex Trauma. Uh, the guide will help to build better capacity of organisations and practitioners to help them better understand complex trauma and make sure that the response, particularly to people with disability, is informed by that information. Uh, this work Order. Part Senator of Rustin, time for the answers expired. Senator Waters online. Thank you very much, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In response to allegations aired earlier this year about branch stacking and misuse of public funds by members of the Victorian Labor Party, the Prime Minister said the issue raised many questions the Leader of the Opposition had to answer. And yet, when allegations of branch stacking and misuse of taxpayer funds by Assistant Treasurer uh, uh, Mr Suka and a senior federal Liberal member were aired this week, the Prime Minister said it was an issue for the Victorian Liberal Party and not his responsibility. Why the double standard on integrity? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, I can confirm uh, that uh, the matters that were raised earlier this week indeed are appropriately a matter for the Victorian Liberal Party organisation, which I understand has taken uh, appropriate uh, steps uh, in relation to uh, an, an individual that, uh, unlike uh, what was the case with the alternative proposal, it's interesting to see how the Greens are in here pitching for the Labour Party. The Greens are in here pitching for the Labour Party. That's, that's, that's uh, interesting to see. But of course, uh, the, the relevant uh, individuals uh, concerned, as I best remember it. I'm not really all that focused on internal uh, party matters like this. I'm focused on the job that the Australian people want us to do, which is to protect people's health and to protect people's livelihoods through this pandemic. That's what we're focused on. But I can confirm uh, for uh, the good senator uh, that uh, you know, the uh, issues that were raised in relation to internal party matters are indeed matters for the Liberal Party organisation. Uh, to the extent that there were issues raised uh, about the alleged uh, misuse of taxpayer-funded uh, parliamentary resources. Well, these are matters that uh, both uh, the relevant uh, federal members concerned have referred uh, for independent uh, inquiry uh, by uh, the uh, Department of Finance, which is the usual process, which is applied uh, indiscriminately on an entirely non-partisan basis whenever these issues arise, as I'm sure members and senators uh, from all around uh, this and the other chamber would be well aware. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Scandal after scandal in this term of government has shown that the Prime Minister is reluctant to enforce his own prime ministerial, ministerial standards uh, to lift those standards of behaviour. Will the Prime Minister investigate whether Assistant Treasurer Mr Sukar's actions have breached the ministerial standards? And will he stand Mr Sukar down while doing so? Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, no attempt at uh, the Greens trialling their code for, the, uh, for a future coalition with the Labor Party, where no doubt they'll uh, come out and try and harm uh, the economy and jobs again, uh, will uh, distract us from our job, which is to support Australians, uh, to support uh, to protect people's uh, health, to protect people's livelihood through this pandemic and to ensure that we put in place the plan for the strongest possible uh, economic and jobs recovery uh, on the other side. That is, that is what we are uh, focused on. You can order. Sorry, po I'm, I was reading something. The clerk passed me. Apologies, Senator McKim, on a, on a point of order. Uh, thank you, President. The point of order is relevance. We're now two-thirds of the way through 
the minister's uh, time provided to answer this question. The question uh, was very clear. It was about uh, prime ministerial standards, ministerial standards, and whether Mr. Sukar would be stood down while the prime minister made that assessment. Uh, minister Cormann has gone nowhere near Thank the question Se in McKim. his answer. And I ask you, you remind him of the question. Senator McKim, you reminded the minister of the second part of the question. It did have a preamble. Um, the minister is allowed some discretion in direct, being directly relevant to the preamble as well, but I've let you remind him of the point of the question, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, it is, uh, you know, clearly a, a, a partisan, a political a question in relation to party organisational matters. It's interesting that in the middle of a pandemic, a, a senator for Queensland is interested in uh, internal party matters in the state of Victoria. I mean, I let the people of Queensland judge that at the next election. Uh, no doubt that is why the vote for the Greens is particularly weak Order, uh, in senator, that particular state. <laughs> senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Uh, yes, thank you, President. Perhaps I'll get an answer to this one. A strong, independent integrity commission is essential if we're going to st uh, stamp out the ongoing scandals that beset this place. How much longer oh, can the government sorry, delay? I'm, I'm going to ask, because we're past three o'clock, we won't impact the time. I'll ask the minister, um, Senator Waters to start again, um, because the volume in the chamber wasn't as loud as it could be. Senator oh, okay. Waters, could you speak up, if you could, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you, President. A strong independent integrity commission is essential if we are to stamp out ongoing scandals in this place. How much longer can the government delay bringing on legislation for a federal corruption watchdog, whether that's my bill, which passed the chamber uh, almost a year ago, or your own bill, which was described as imminent 18 months ago? What more does this government have to hide? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Australia has one of the proudest and best records in the world when it comes to uh, providing open and transparent and accountable government. And I can see Senator McKim uh, sneer at that, but that is a fact. And of course, we are, we are committed to pursue further reforms uh, in, this, in this regard uh, to even further strengthen an already strong uh, position. What I would say, I think the Australian people well understand why uh, over the last six months we have prioritised our crisis response to protect people's lives, to suppress the spread of the virus, to slow down the spread of the virus, to ensure that our hospitals could handle uh, the inflow of patients into the health system, to ensure that we provided the necessary supports uh, to Australian businesses, Australian workers and those Australians who lost their jobs. I think Australians understand that there has been a pandemic going on and that uh, clearly it was quite appropriate that in this context we prioritise the uh, many measures that had to be taken as part of a crisis response. I and I thank uh, the Senate and uh, ask that further questions thank be placed on a notice paper. Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, pursuant to, order, to Standing Order 164.3, I ask the Minister representing the Minister for Education for an explanation as to why an order for the production of documents agreed to on 16 June 2020 concerning support for international students has not been complied with. On this particular issue, um, well, so I'm just taking some advice from the clerk. Senator Birmingham on a point of order, I understand. Okay. Thank, thank, th thanks, Mr. President. On a point of order uh, relating to, uh, to Standing Order 164, Part 3, uh, it, is, uh, it is, of course, uh, open to a senator to, at the conclusion of question time, ask a question in relation to non compliance in relation to an order for the production of documents. But I do note that, uh, that part three uh, of Standing Order 164 is very clear that it is, uh, if a minister does not comply with an order for the production of documents directed to the minister within 30 days after the date specified for compliance of the order. I'd invite you, Mr President, uh, to uh, look at this particular matter uh, in that uh, the question and the order for the production of documents that Senator Faruqi raises indeed has had a response provided to the Senate. Uh, it's a response that identifies that no such documents exist in relation to the order uh, moved by Senator Faruqi and carried by the Senate. Uh, now, Mr President, that is compliance with the order uh, and the standing order that Senator Faruqi raises this matter under requires non-compliance. Uh, for, uh, for the questioning to be valid. I'm not sure how uh, a minister is meant to provide for compliance uh, where no such documents exist other than to inform the Senate of such. So, 
Are you speaking on to the point of order, Senator Faruqi, on the point of order? Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I contend that the order was not complied with. The order was for any documents created, sent or received by relevant department and ministerial offices relating to a national hardship fund or similar program payment or initiative to support international students during COVID-19. This does not imply that a fund had to be established or in operation. Indeed, the Senate order was intentionally drafted widely to capture any initiatives the government may have been working on but did not eventuate. I know for a fact that there are documents that relate to a national hardship fund that fall within the scope of this order because I submitted a freedom of information request to the Department of Education worded similarly to the order relating to the exact same time period which identified about 200 pages of material relevant to the request. Thank, thank you. Um, Sen oh, are you speaking on the point of order? Oh, so I just on, can I rule on the point of order? I have to take the opportunity to have some advice. Um, Standing Order 1643 provides opportunities for senators after question time to seek an explanation from a minister if a minister does not comply with an order for documents within a specified period and does not in that time provide to the Senate quote, an explanation of why the order has not been complied with, which the Senate resolves is satisfactory. Although that provision was inserted with the standing orders in 2005, it has only been used on a handful of occasions and its interpretation has not been the subject of any previous rulings. The provisions are, however, analogous to the provisions of Standing Order 74.5, which allow senators to seek explanations for unanswered questions on notice and estimates questions. Early rulings on that standing order established that it ceases to be available once an answer has been provided. Standing Order 1643, in my view, operates in the same way. If a minister has complied with an order for documents, the process set out in the standing order is no longer available, and the senator may not seek an explanation under the order. Now, as I understand it, and I appreciate Senator Faruqi's contribution there, the government's responses to the order are unequivocal in stating that no documents exist that meet the terms of the order. Absent any motion being moved in the Senate to contradict the government's response, I consider it reasonable in my position to accept the government's responses and to conclude that the order has been complied with. I'm not in a position to determine contested claims. If there is a disagreement over the interpretation of an order, as seems to be the case here, from what I've just heard and from the advice I have received, the standing order does not provide a means for determining that disagreement. There are, however, other procedures in the Senate that a senator can use to further pursue the matter. I thank senators. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Gallagher. Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to questions asked by Labor senators uh, today. And uh, thank you. Um, when he, uh, in question time today, the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck, admitted that the Morrison government's cabinet has not been briefed or was not briefed about the Victorian outbreak until the 5th of August. That is more than six weeks after initial cases were identified, and on that day there was already 1,435 COVID-positive cases linked to aged care outbreaks. There was nearly 100 facilities impacted, and sadly on that day, the day the Cabinet was first briefed, another 10 Australians died. I would like to extend my condolences to everyone who has been touched by this crisis in aged care through losing loved ones, to those in hospitals to those battling the virus and to those who have been sick with worry and who have not been able to see their loved ones. Let us be clear. The Morrison government has responsibility for aged care in Australia, and they have failed to protect aged care residents from this virus. This failure has not happened overnight. It has been years in the making. The Morrison government has failed by not having the aged care portfolio in the Cabinet. It has failed by having review after review but then doing nothing to act on them. It has failed by not dealing with the serious and escalating workforce issues which have been known and which reviews have gathered dust on their desk for years and years. It has failed by cutting billions of dollars in funding over several budgets and then using weasel words to pretend they never did. Well, budget papers don't lie. The Morrison government has cut money 
that was meant to go to the aged care sector. The Prime Minister, as the Treasurer, was the architect of these cuts, and those cuts have taken a fragile system and they have broken it. They have broken it. it there is clearly no redundancy left. The real life experience in Victoria that we have seen play out in heartbreaking scenes where aged care facilities have had no capacity to deal with a virus like COVID-19 when it came into their home. We have seen images of elderly Australians being evacuated from their homes, malnourished, dehydrated, missing medication, soiled, distressed and alone. So don't stand here and tell us how fortunate we have been. Don't say how well we have done. Don't try and shirk responsibility and blame others. People in aged care in Australia today don't need spin and a rewriting of a, or a convenient interpretation of what has happened in Victoria. The facts speak to themselves. From mid-June, when positive cases in Victoria started to rise, what did this government do to protect residents of aged care? They knew they were vulnerable. They knew from what had happened in the Northern Hemisphere when community transmission rates increase, the risk for people in residential aged care increases exponentially. They already knew that. From a handful of cases in early July to 1,000 cases by the end of that month alone, more than 125 facilities with outbreaks, more than 335 deaths and more than 2,000 cases linked to aged care. No matter which way the government tries to spin the crisis in aged care, these facts tell a story of failure. Failure to protect vulnerable citizens from COVID-19 getting into their homes and then failure to stop the spread. The result of a system that remains hidden from public view, housing vulnerable people, the quietest of all Australians, who, after doing their best for this country, have been abandoned by a Prime Minister who is quick to point the finger at others but who clearly didn't do enough quick enough, by a minister clearly without authority or influence, and by a system that has been fractured by neglect, underfunding and the indifference of this government over seven long years. The Royal Commission heard compelling evidence that the system for older Australians is woefully inadequate. That is a quote from a, a report titled Neglect that was given to this government in November last year. You would think it's, the title speaks volumes. And the Royal Commission itself has put in writing that the system is woefully inadequate. They knew this in November. The Royal Commissioners go on to say many people receiving aged care have had their basic human rights denied. Their dignity is not respected and their identity is ignored. It is most certainly is not a full life. It's a shocking tale of neglect. Well, we say old Australians deserve better than this. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Madam Deputy President, older Australians most certainly do deserve better than this. What we've seen here today is an absolute disgrace and outrage. From the Labor Party coming in here, speaking of cases, uh, people's lives that have, you know, and families that have been devastated, to come in here and make political points off the back of those very, very sad uh, situations and stories is an absolute disgrace, and I am quite set back by this, I've got to say. There have been 335 deaths in our aged care facilities. Now, that's a number, but it actually represents individuals. It represents communities and, importantly, it represents families. Families that over the last few months have had a significant amount of grief, significant amount of grief. And they're dealing with that. And to have Labor come in here and drag out these stories and make a political point, conflating two different versions of stories together to make a, uh, a political point against a minister that is, that is uh, actually done uh, a significant amount to ensure that this pandemic— I mean, it is a crisis. It is a crisis that we're dealing with. And to deal with it has been the number one priority of this government. In fact, the Prime Minister has said that this is his number one focus right now. 
It has the focus of this government in ensuring that we can deal with this crisis and this pandemic. In everywhere across the world, when there has been an outbreak like what we've seen in Victoria, there have always been cases in aged care facilities. And it's the ability to deal with those cases and those outbreaks and deal with them in such a way that you minimise the impact and, importantly, the impact on lives that is important. And if this side were actually serious about what's going on, then they'd actually be asking questions about what we're doing and how we could actually uh, mitigate further the risk that has been caused by the outbreak that's occurred under a Labor government down there in Victoria. The Prime Minister is absolutely committed to ensuring that we are able to deal with this, that the communities that are responsible, that the, the families that are involved are getting the best possible support. All services with an active case of COVID-19 are receiving support from the Australian government, including a single case manager and access to PPE testing in residential aged care facilities and access to sur a surge workforce and supplementation. We heard the minister explain that in one particular facility they had to replace an entire workforce across that facility in 24 hours. An outbreak occurred that of course went through the workplace. And I want to right now I want to I want to pay tribute to those that are in uh, the healthcare sector and particularly in aged care. My sister works in an aged care facility and I know she turns up to work not knowing what would happen. But bravely fronts up to work knowing that, that, that you know, what's protecting them is a mask or, or a face shield. And they are brave Australians that are doing this. And that support for them is absolutely critical. And we saw in that one facility there in Victoria an entire workforce substituted within 24 hours. We heard before from Senator Gallagher who spoke about so-called cuts that have been made into uh, made in the in the health care, uh, in the aged care sector. Well, it's only it's only Labor that could actually call a billion dollars worth of increases a cut. I mean, Labor's claim has actually been debunked by ABC's fact check. And despite Labor's plans for 387 billion dollars in higher taxes, there was nothing in their plan leading up to the last election that showed any sort of commitment to increasing and supporting the aged care sector like what this government has done. Nothing. And so they've got the goal to be calling these things when they actually have no plan. They've not put forward anything that would suggest that they have a commitment like what this government has got. Labor's hypocrisy is evident, is obvious, obvious at this time with this sort of nonsense that we see coming into this place. The Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety Interim Report said it was difficult not to be critical of successive government's failures to fix the aged care system. But this government is committed to working with the Thank sector— Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Your time has expired. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, Minister Colbeck has staked out today that he's simply under political attack and the opposition's uh, questions of him and continual questioning of him is somehow unjustified. Well, this question time we've seen more and more simple facts come out that highlight the incompetence now not only of Minister Colbeck but indeed of the entire government in failing to take account of the grievous situation confronting uh, aged care, particularly in Victoria. We've seen more than 350 deaths, and yet we have done, seen nothing from this government than talk up purported relativities of how well they're doing uh, compared to the rest of the world or, or other parts of, parts of the globe. The simple fact is these deaths were preventable. They were absolutely preventable. They were preventable by this government if they had put in place proper response to what had happened at Dorothy Henderson Lodge and indeed at Newmarch House. And indeed, the Aged Care Royal Commission 
and other incidents that happened in aged care some 12 months ago and before that all highlight how ill-prepared aged care is for these pandemic-type situations. We have a government who has not put in place the measures that would have prevented this. It's all very well for the government to blame uh, Victoria, but the simple fact is this situation is not occurring in all aged care settings. It is occurring in settings where it's got in and where there has been uh, uh, poor control uh, of uh, uh, transmission of the virus. There is a lack of PPE in some of these, these places. There is a lack of training in some of these places. And indeed, what is, I think, most telling of all is the appalling rates of pay that aged care workers doing intimate care support, feeding people, putting to them to bed, changing their clothes, that do not have adequate personal protective equipment, showering them, taking them to the toilet, managing people with dementia in all their daily intimate activities who do not have adequate personal protective equipment. Now, these are things that should have been a top priority right from the outset in response to Dorothy Henderson Lodge, in response to Newmarch House. The simple fact is, and uh, Senator O'Sullivan should know, should know uh, these issues, that in fact the minimum wage of uh, uh, the, the aged care wage, which is close to the minimum wage, if you uh, currently earn, uh, currently take home job seeker because you're not earning enough hours, and you take on uh, some part-time hours in aged care, then currently you could lose your eligibility for job seeker. So there is no incentive to work, and this is indeed another driving force behind uh, the lack of aged care staff in some settings. And the, the government fiddled around with settings uh, within our social security system without actually fixing some of the problems that confront people when it comes to disincentives to work. People are expected to work for some uh, uh, $10 an hour after you consider those disincentives to work. This is an appalling state of affairs that this government has failed to take accountability for. We've heard that the Minister for Aged Care has failed to brief the Cabinet. He's briefed the Prime Minister. Well, the Prime Minister needs to take responsibility for the mess in aged care. And, and there are hundreds of grieving families around this nation, not just from those that have died from COVID, but all those who've been locked out uh, of aged care settings in being able to spend uh, the dying days uh, with their loved ones. This is an appalling state of affairs, and the government must show some respect and accountability. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Um, Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And can I start by saying that the behaviour of the Labor Party in response to aged care deaths has been tawdry, to say the least. Instead of taking the high ground and seeking to find a solution, Labor has taken the well-worn path it always takes and grandstands on other people's misfortunes. Does Labor really think that if it had been in government, it could have handled the pandemic any, any better? Of course not. They're not interested in finding solutions. They're only interested in point scoring. And you can take the words of Deputy Chief Medical Officer Nick Coatsworth this in the, to the Royal Commission. The assertion that there is an attitude of futility towards death in residential aged care in Australia is frankly insulting to the entire Australian community who locked down to prevent deaths amongst our most vulnerable. There are many words used in the Royal Commission witness statements today that perhaps don't reflect the totality of the government's response, both at the federal and state level, to prevent deaths in aged care. The fact is coronavirus is a highly contagious retrovirus with elevated case fatality rates in the elderly and those with comorbidities. The vast majority will get it mildly and get over it, and some may not even realise they had it at all. The containment measures put in place by the Morrison government 
has, some, has been some of the best in the world and have gone a long way to reducing the prevalence of the virus and surge impacts on our hospitals. Not that you would know it if you listened to Labor. Their attacks on Senator Colbeck has been frankly despicable. No one has worked harder than our Prime Minister and our Health Minister the, and, and Richard Senator Colbeck, sorry, in trying to keep Australians safe. And to quote our Chief Medical, who was our Chief Medical Officer, Brendan Murphy, Australia's overall COVID death rate as a proportion of cases is around 1.5 per cent, compared to 15 per cent in the UK and 5 per cent in the USA. Our death rate in aged care across Australia as a proportion of total aged care residents is 0.1 per cent, one in a thousand, compared to 5 per cent in the UK, where really nearly 20,000 deaths have been seen. He also said that no matter how prepared and resourced the aged care sector is, this outbreak will, unfortunately, only finally come under control with the suppression of community transmission. The best way to protect older people is to suppress community transmission. And Labor needs to remember that no one is doing be a better job than that than the Coalition's Gladys Berejiklian in New South Wales, who, despite having received over 50 per cent of cases in quarantine from international arrivals, has kept a lid on community transmission. Compare that to Labor's, Labor's Daniel Andrews whose mismanagement is the root of the com community transmission in Victoria. Do we hear a word out of Labor about that? Of course not. Complete and utter silence. And did Daniel Andrews consult anyone be put before he pulled out over 100 staff out of St Basil's before provisions were made to find replacement staff? Of course not. It was left to the federal government to come along and clean up the mess left by uh, Daniel Andrews. And I should point out to Senator Gallagher that while we might be responsible for aged care, we're not responsible for health. And if the, uh, uh, Daniel Andrews had actually consulted the federal government, we might have been able to step in and help out the aged care centre before leaving those people in a more vulnerable state. But that's Daniel Andrews for you. He's the Frank, Frank Sinatra of Australian politics. It's always his way or the highway never consults with anyone, typical Labor, all command and control, no consultation, no consultation, I'll just do it my way. And can I say, as a Queenslander, I want to apologise to other Australians, especially those in northern New South Wales, who have not been able to get access to proper health because of the selfish actions of the Queensland Premier, Anna Palaszczuk, in shutting down the borders. There have been young children in New northern New South Wales who have not been able to access medical uh, resources in Brisbane. I have never, never felt so ashamed to be a Queenslander. What kind of a person puts her own self-interests in front of the health of young Australians? I say it's absolutely shameful. And it's worth pointing out that, that the Australian government in January— Thank you, Senator okay. Rennick. Your time has expired. Senator Green. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, sometimes uh, I think the Senate would serve to have a few more minutes from Senator Rennick because the longer he goes, the worse it gets. The worse it gets. Order. By the end of five minutes, he's back on to blaming someone else. The Morrison government's MO. Blaming somebody else for what is a Morrison government responsibility, aged care. That is what we are talking about today. Firstly, can I begin by doing something that Senator Rennick didn't and acknowledging, acknowledging how awful it must be for those families who are grieving, the 328 families who have lost loved ones to see this debate turn into a blame game from people opposite. I also want to acknowledge the essential workers who are day in, day out working in aged care. And I thank them for taking the time, 
spending the time to speak to people like me and other senators and other members of parliament to explain to us exactly what is going on. Because if you didn't listen to those workers directly and you listened to those opposite, you'd think everything is fine. But when you speak to these workers directly, they will tell you that this has been coming for a long time, that things are very desperate, and they are at their absolute wit's end because they love the jobs they do. They love the residents that they care for, but they are not being given the appropriate resources, and they haven't been given the appropriate resources for an incredibly long time from this government. We know that the 328 families who are grieving deserve answers from this minister, from Minister Colbeck and from the Prime Minister. So no, Labor's not going to apologise for asking questions about the deaths of 328 Australians. That is not disgraceful or despicable. Those, answers, those questions need to be asked and they need to be answered. But when we ask these questions, the minister isn't able to answer them. He doesn't have the figures, he doesn't have the detail, or he reje rejects the premise of the question. That is not good enough for these families. We know that the government didn't have a plan for aged care, yet there were many warning signs and opportunities which would have alerted this minister to the very serious consequences of his inaction. We know that Peter Rosen, QC, revealed in the Royal Commission neither the Commonwealth Department of, of Health nor the aged care regulator developed COVID-19 plans specifically for the aged care. The very first case of COVID-19 at New March House was reported on April 11, and the government failed to act for weeks after more than 60 cases of COVID were reported among staff and residents and 16 lives were lost. In April, in April, they had the warning sign that they needed that this would be devastating if it ever infected an aged care facility. And yet, after that, they still did not develop a plan. The lack of urgency is staggering. The Morrison government is responsible for aged care, but they failed to protect aged care residents, not only when it comes to this crisis, but before this crisis started. And on the minister's performance today, can I just say this? The minister and those opposite refuse to accept the premise of questions that we're asking or even that we're asking those questions in the first place. Somehow, even asking those questions is too much for this minister to take. This minister says that we are very fortunate. We are in a much better position than other countries. That the minister said that I would rather be in Australia than anywhere else when it comes to aged care. Well, ask the families of these 328 people who have died in aged care. Ask these workers if they would rather be somebody, somewhere else. That is a question you, that Senator this minister Green, needs to answer. Has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Lambie. Thank you. Six months ago, the Prime Minister— Senator Lambie, you need to indicate to the Senate what you're doing. Oh, sorry. So I move to take note of, of answers. Thank you. Answers, answers from who? To my question. Sorry. To I'm sorry. Who answers to take no, uh, note? To who? Which, which minister? Uh, minister Reynolds. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. No worries. Off Six months ago, the Prime Minister announced he was going to give us something bigger and better than a royal commission into veteran suicides, but it wasn't ready to go yet. He said. So he said, while we wait, let's start with an interim commissioner instead, someone who would start immediately, somebody who would report within 12 months. Now today, 200 days later, nobody has started. There's no report six months away. There is no interim commissioner at all. Two things are possible. Either the interim commissioner was ready to go immediately or they weren't. Imagine you're running late for work. Your boss calls you asking, where are you? You apologise. Sorry, sorry, mate. I'm on my way. 
You say to your boss, I'm leaving immediately, right away. Six months later, your boss calls you asking where you are. You say to your boss, guess what, I haven't left yet, mate, but I'm getting ready to go, I'll be there soon. You reckon you'd still have a job? I can't turn up to work 200 days late and expect there'll be a job for you when you finally arrive. Not only has our interim commissioner not turned up, we don't even know who, who it's supposed to be and who, is, who should have turned up. And who hasn't? If a person goes missing for six months, you'd assume that they're long dead and buried. The interim commissioner has been missing for six months and nobody has noticed. You want to know why? Because this isn't a job anybody got asked to fill in the first place. That's the reality. Instead of doing what hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Australians have begged for it to do, the Morrison government has gone and done something completely different. Not just something different, something worse. Are we surprised? He leads the same Liberal Party that's been waiting over a year to respond to the Productivity Commission's scathing criticism of the Department of Veterans Affairs because he cares so much about veterans. That's a report that said the Department of Veterans Affairs was so unfit for purpose that we should just tear it down and start again. And I can assure you nothing has changed. It's the same Liberal Party that sat on independent review saying Teddy Sheehan deserved a Victoria Cross for nearly a year, denying a hero the honour he deserves because they didn't think it was a priority. We've got a government that doesn't have a national commissioner, doesn't have an interim commissioner, doesn't have a terms of reference, doesn't have a starting date, doesn't have a final reporting date. But what it does have is an absolute certainty that whatever they're going to do, no matter what, will be bigger and better than a Royal Commission. Six months we've been waiting for the, Royal, for the interim commissioner to start immediately. When the government claimed it was ready to go immediately, it wasn't even ready to pick someone who's ready to go. It had nobody lined up. It had no terms of reference lined up. It had absolutely nothing. No work, no substance, no nothing. The National Commissioner doesn't have the power, flexibility, independence or authority of a Royal Commission. It's a Commissioner who's been granted the stamp of approval from the Australian Defence Force and the Department of Veterans Affairs, the very institutions that an independent Royal Commission would examine. You don't give witnesses the ability to choose the questions they're asked. You don't give the Department of Veterans Affairs or the Australian Defence Force the ability to choose the questions they're asked either. The fact we've done that is reason enough to oppose it. Since February, we've been, we've been waiting for the, for the interim commissioner. But what's more disturbing is that you'll get a commission, you'll get commission that's a hack job instead of a royal commission that's the real deal and that should have been given to the veterans in the first place. I've got to put the question by Senator Lambie. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Um, I rise to take note of Minister Birmingham's answer representing the Minister for Education. Yes, which hypocrites got free uni education and are now trying to double the cost of degrees? At least 16 members of the government, including the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister, the Health Minister, the Skills Minister and the Communications Minister. Every one of them was at uni while it was free. But they're planning to hike fees, condemn students to decades of debt cut up to $900 million from teaching and learning and punish struggling students, all while youth wage growth is the flattest in history and unemployment is skyrocketing. The hypocrisy is gobsmacking, but the problems don't stop there. It won't create nearly enough new student places to match population growth and meet new demand due to recession. The billions in student debt will disproportionately hit women. For regional universities, it's not just billions in extra debt for students, it's billions not being spent in those communities. The government's own officials admit the plan won't even encourage students to study the courses that they claim they care about. But it will encourage unis to enroll students in high fee courses instead of STEM. Finally, it does nothing whatsoever to save uni jobs or fix the research crisis. The good news is that the Senate can block this unfixable mess. I urge my colleagues on the crossbench to do just that. The Greens will be voting against this bill with all our might. And you can help by calling and emailing crossbench senators right now. Question is the motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.